rituals and practices. So last night I decided that maybe I should pick up something uh, and try to present it here today because I hadn't written a speech at all. I had no idea what I was going to talk about and Robin forced me to give a topic uh, before we went to press. So I told her that I was going to talk about atheism because after all I am an atheist. So I decided that uh, what I would like to do is to go back and pick up an outline for a book that I had written, started to write seven years ago. And some of these books that I have in my head are important and they're never gonna get written because none of you will support us financially enough to hire a secretary for me. I've only been 23 years without a secretary, the only president of any organization in the world who has never had a secretary. So let me tell you a little bit about this. I am trying uh, to gather information and to analyze as I can. And some of my information gathering and research has taken me years. Religion has never been dispassionately studied at all. It has been attacked by the non-believer or it has been used as an instrument by the believer. But it is a preserved fossil and is fully representative of the views and the intent of some primal societies. And I decided that I would like to look at some of the primary reasons for religion. Some of the greatest minds in the world have attempted to find out what was the origin of religion, and they're all wrong because primarily they were all men. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing where religion stands. With an unerring instinct, the religionists have always stood their ground and fought on those principles which are radical principles of religion, that is, those principles which go to the roots. And the rationalists, the atheists, the intellectuals are always defeating themselves because they go into something that is irrelevant to religion. They never get to their roots. And I have been fascinated by church dogma and I have been fascinated by church rituals because the rituals of religion reveal the marrow in the bones. What do these rituals represent? They are stylized actions which people undertake and they have little or no reference to their origin or their ongoing meaning. All of the stylized rituals of religion are insane. It has absolutely nothing to do with life. It has nothing to do with knowledge. It has nothing to do with meaning. They are absolutely repugnant and stereotyped. So why do they continue? They go completely beyond natural law or natural regulations. They are almost like military drills. And as I say, they are simply stereotyped. So I started to look at re religious rituals. The first and dr most dramatic was human sacrifice. People were killed, but they were always killed in a bloody way, and the blood was necessary. It was absolutely important to have blood associated with it, and I'll get to this later. The second most dramatic thing was torture, with ha which had to do with continual excessive pain, and most frequently it had to do also with the mutilation of the sexual organs, both male and female. And I'm going back into the most primitive communities to look at this. The third was a negation of an absolutely human necessary act, the act of sexual activity. There has been an extraordinary attempt by religion to repress all sexual activity. A fourth ritual was a ritual regarding certain days which were lucky and certain days which were unlucky. That's insane. There is no reason to have a lucky day. Another thing was a ritual destruction of food or a ritual destruction of the most valuable things in the community. A refraining from eating of certain foods 
or a particular food that is eaten. And then there's another ritual that, which has to do with the visitation of presumed sacred spots. It's more holy to be in church on Easter Sunday than it is to be holy in this hotel. It's the same building, the same ground, wood, concrete, lumber. Why is one more holy than other? Why is it necessary to take an annual required trip to Mecca and without touching the black stone of Kaaba, you are in desperate difficulty? And then another ritual, the seventh one, was the performance of specific ceremonies to cast out devils, exercise ghosts, release from possession or thwart wit witches. And all of religion, every single religion in the world is absolutely concentrated on demon possession, demonology, exorcism, devils, and it gets into the nebulous concept of the soul. Another ritual was a ritual to turn a profane person, a regular ordinary person like you and I, into a sacred person. And this transformation from a profane person to a sacred person is done by very specific initiation rites, all of which are so crazy, it's incredible. Dunking people in water <laughs> or attaching God ideas to them, such as the God Reagan, or turning dead men into gods by means of special funerary rites. And another ritual is the unending repetition of certain formulae of words. And these formulae of words are absolutely bizarre. And the linguists cannot translate for us what they mean. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah my ass, you know. <laughs> What's it mean? There's no reason to have these. There is no practical end for any ritual. There is nothing natural in the performance of any ritual. Animals don't perform rituals. Animals have no rights. Animals, the only thing that they have that could be in any way categorized as a right is courting dances. And that's the male. The male showing off his colors, showing off his prowess, showing off his dances for the female, and the female sits there and sniffs a while and thinks, well, I don't know. <laughs> I just wonder why any historian or any anthropo anthropo anthropologist anywhere hasn't really looked at the human community, why they don't look at them. Because man is not some dumb brute of an animal, and I read all of these theories about from whence religion came. Men were overawed by thunder. Bullshit. <laughs> I mean, come on. Any of you didn't know what thunder was from the day you were born? What makes you think that a primitive man being born didn't understand thunder? Uh, any primitive child, any place. Because the human community has always been subjected to rain, thunder, lightning, wind, weather. So of all of the animals. And suddenly we're going to make gods out of them, like the cows made gods out of thunder, or the lions made gods out of rain. These are natural phenomena, and we adjusted to them over a series of millions of years now. Because with Lucy evident, it looks like human beings have been around, oh, perhaps 10 million years. We don't know. Maybe longer than that. Men saw night follow day. That's what's been going on. He saw summer follow spring. Now somebody was born into a primitive community and his father said, now listen, son, we're not going to have spring this year. <laughs> this is crazy. We have absolutely been associated with the natural qualities of the earth from time immemorial. And I do not believe that any of the God theories that have been given are correct. The idea of nature worship, the idea of primitive animism, the idea of the personification of unseen forces, the idea of the fear of the unknown, the idea of the sense of numinousness, which is holiness, 
I think that these are ideas which are made up to explain the rituals about which nobody knows anything anymore. Because the rituals have all, the meaning of all of the rituals have been lost in human history. These rituals made up religion. In a modified form, they still make up religion today. For the religious person who's over right now in church on Easter Sunday is going through a ritual, and none of them know why they're going through those rituals. They simply know that they're doing it. And without the rituals, they wouldn't have any religion. Without make-believe talk with gods, for instance, prayer, there would be no religion. But they serve no practical end, no useful end. So let's look so at some of them, because I've been looking at some of these now for years, and from these come an extraordinary message to me that I'm hoping I'm, I'll be able to get over to you. And I'm capsulizing pages and pages of uh, references here, which I have in an unending way. One of the ideas of ritual is ritual celibacy and ritual prostitution. And I would like to look at some of that as I go along. An example is a nun, a bride of Christ. They hold themselves out for their entire life as virgins because they are going to become brides of Christ when they die. <laughs> because Christ somewhere is a polygamous animal and up in heaven he is going to be able to fornicate with all of these nuns <laughs> and their dead flesh and have thousands of ejaculations a night <laughs> in order to accomplish this. This is crazy. This is crazy. And another part of the religi re uh, another religious ritual that I want to briefly put in here is the theory of burning food or of dietary laws. And the idea, of course, it has been advanced by some theoretic theoreticians, is that in burning the food, the food is, in, is burnt, turns into smoke, the smoke ascends into heaven, and this smoke is received in heaven as an idea of the um, offering that one has been given. We see pilgrimages to Mecca, to Benares, to Lourdes, to Rome, to the big cathedrals and the repeating of these word formulae. So let me get down to some of the things that I am seeing in this. Because without these spiritual rituals, I do not think that there would be any Roman Catholicism today. There would be no Methodism today. There would be no Presbyterianism today. Because the, 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 the uh, rituals are forms which are observed and although they are in deteriorating, still the rituals continue. Let's take one of the first rituals, the ritual of human sacrifice. And always this thing goes with it. There is a preparation of the site, there is a preparation of the materials, and there is a preparation of the officiant. And then the rite itself consists of actions and words and sounds usually in a holy place. In most of the times that I have looked at these old rituals, a site was swept and washed and sprinkled with water or sprinkled with blood, had hands waved over it, spells recited over it, and or it was set apart, isolated, fenced off, elevated, covered, delineated somehow physically. And this was accompanied co with constant consecrations, lustrations, fumigations. In the Judeo religion, as a matter of fact, when you got into the inner sanctum, nothing was there. There was nothing in the Holy of Holies. It was absolutely a barren space. Then sacrificial foods and drinks are prepared, something special. The sacred vessels and the utensils are brought out and special cloths have to be attached to them. Often musical instruments and there has to be a special dress accompanying this, like all of the little kids over there in church are dressed up specially for their sacrifice to that church. 
And now to the officiant. The cardinal rule is that no one may perform any one of these rites unless they're entitled to it. This is the fight of the women right now. They are fighting to get in. No woman can just go into a church and officiate at a rite. She must be given some sort of recognition and or training in order to get involved in that rite. For a great number of years, the title was hereditary or by adoption or by a form of initiation or by special training or by demonstrating a fitness such as going into a trance in order to be able to go through with this rite. And in most of the religions, the rites are only available to the priestcraft and the priestcraft has been hereditary. And it's not enough just to be qualified because the officiants must also prepare themselves by observances of food taboos and sex taboos. Depending on what country and what time in history, they were smeared with blood or with oil or with pigments, or they had to have a special garment, or they had to wear special insignia, or they had to wear special clothing. And related to this were all kind of, quote, creation rights. But every time anything was done, it was always done out of something. It was never done out of nothing. And this is important. The rainmakers took a wee little bit of water, and then they could make rain out of that handful of water. The Australian magician makes kangaroos from small stones which represent kangaroos. And even God made man from the dust. He didn't make him out of nothing. He made him out of the dust. And remember, God didn't make manna out of nothing. He made it from the dew. And God, Moses made a serpent from a wand. They all had something to start with. Elisha created an unfailing supply of oil because he had several drops to start with. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ made wine out of water. And Jesus Christ made a meal of fishes out of two fish or seven fish, I've forgotten which, two fish, I guess. And even our fairy tales do this because Cinderella's fairy grandmother made a coach and horses, not out of nothing, but out of something. She made it out of a pumpkin and rats. I'm long-winded, I'm making a point. And then let's look at the mass because this is important and I'll get this all together in a few minutes here. The idea with mass is that once upon a time God renewed the life of his worshipers by creating a replica of his body and of his blood and giving it to them in small pieces. So it's necessary first for a priest to utter words of divine power and by assuming the character of a God and then performing the miracle of touching the wafer and the wine and putting it in your mouth and when he touches the wafer and the wine it turns into the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ and you partake of that in your mouth. Also it's very important that all of the religious rituals and feasts and rites were held on certain days. What's the matter with Tuesday? What's the matter with Thursday? It can only be on Sunday. And there has been blood shed in a continuing way over the proper day of Easter. I am writing history just of how Easter was dated. It'll be a 700 page book. Bloody, bloody wars over why Easter, when Easter, how Easter. Why should God care whether Easter is celebrated on the 6th, the 13th, the 21st, the 3rd, why should God care that it must be at absolutely a propitious moment? And all of these rites are not an appendage of religion. They are religion. So as I'm reading all of these, something comes to me in an overpowering way that all of this is anti-life. Every ritual is anti-life. Every ritual is anti-sexuality. Every ritual is anti-human. Every ritual is anti-animal. And every ritual primarily is anti-woman.
And I'm trying to look at these roots of this upon the Christian community, and I got Lawrence Stern's book, Tristram Shandy. All it is is just a story. But he had an excommunication in it, and he had lifted that excommunication out of an actual excommunication which was given by the Boston churches, Roman Catholic churches, in his time, and had been approved by those churches uh, to uh, use. Uh, this particular one that he has in was composed by a bishop, Bishop Ernolfus, a French Benedictine appointed prior of Canterbury Cathedral by Anselm. He had lived uh, from 1040 to 1124. And these excommunications, have you ever seen them? These are the most extraordinary things I have ever read. May you be cursed in living, in dying, in eating, in sleeping, in being hungry, in being thirsty, in fasting, in sleeping, in slumbering, in waking, in walking, in standing, in shitting, in pissing, in bloodletting, and in fucking. But also you, may you be cursed in the hair of your head, in the brain of your temple, in the top of your head, in your temple, in your forehead, in your ears, in your eyebrows, in your cheeks, in your jawbones, in your nostrils, in your foreteeth, in your grinders, in your lips, in your throats, in your shoulders, your wrists, your arms, your hands, your fingers, in your breasts, in your heart, in the interior parts of the very stomach, in the reins, in the groin, in the thigh, in the genitalia, in the hips, in the knees, in the legs, in the feet, in the joints, in the nails. When they said, God damn you, <laughs> they meant it. looking at all of this and it's all crazy so far isn't it crazy so far it's just completely crazy and then you say to me Madeline you know you're profane quite frequently me innocent little me so I looked up profane and fain and I looked up uh, every definition of what this could be and I found that this was a height of idiocy because there is no such thing as a forbidden word who dares to put take one of my words, any one of them, and say to me, you cannot utter this. Can the church do this? Can the state do this? Can my mother do this? Can the schools do this? Do you dare to say to me, I cannot utter them? What is the difference between uttering one of these words and not uttering one of these words? And it's, it's important, and it gets more important as I go on. But anytime any one of you will tell me the difference between it, when I urinate and when I piss, I'll stop pissing tomorrow and start to urinate. <laughs> the whole idea of putting a religious charge on words, and I finally found this out and I bring it to you as a revelation today, <laughs> is to pretend that these things or functions do not exist. You are not supposed to be doing any of these things because they are animal activities and we are spiritual human beings. And we have done this in a continual way in games that we play diplomatically and otherwise. We pretend it isn't there. In New Zealand and Australia, they have an ostrich which puts its head in the sand and sees no evil. And we do this. We play this religious game. Do you realize that we did not recognize Russia for a country for 40 years? We pretended it wasn't there. And in our legal parlance in international law, we said it might be a de facto country, but it's not a de jure country. De facto means that it's really there, but de jure means that we're not going to recognize it legally. We did the same thing with Cuba. We did the same thing with American Indians. We did the same thing with women in the United States. We did the same thing with blacks. And now have you read a Gallup poll lately? Have you listened to Ronald Reagan? There are no atheists. 99% of America is Christian or born again, and we think there may be 1% of something else, but those are just people who don't go to church. So we say this. 
All right, let's look at some curse words because this got me off on it. I went someplace and I said something like, oh, go to hell. And I was thoroughly chastised for this. Oh, I'll tell you what it was. The first time I ever swore in my life because I came from a very, very um, prudish family. And I was reared with a tremendous amount of prudery in my family. I don't think that I ever said a four-letter word until I was at least 45 because my parents would not have believed it. Incidentally, I recently discovered something. People have dirty dreams. <laughs> I was so indoctrinated and programmed with prudery that I never had a dirty dream in my life. So I thought I'd better work on this. <laughs> But this is how much women were indoctrinated. I'm 65. I never heard the word menstruation in my entire life as a young adult. I didn't know that's what I did. This is how closed it was in American culture. But look at these taboo words because it leads us into something else. The po taboo words are in three categories and three categories only. Parts of the body which perform functions which is necessary to life. You cannot live if you do not urinate. It is absolutely, totally impossible to live if you do not urinate, if you do not defecate. You're dead. The functions of those parts of the body. You cannot name their locale. You cannot name their functions. And the functions are both transitive and intransitive verbs. <laughs> And then the third class are words and derogation of women. That's all. Those are the only three classes of forbidden words in any language. So this started me to thinking, because why shouldn't we have this? And I did a complete review of all the literature in the world, and I mean a complete review. You tell me one story, one classic book that ever mentions that the guy defecated, the hero. Come on, name it. Tell me one book, one play, one cinema where the woman softly whispered to him, I can't, honey, I'm on the rag. <laughs> Come on. Has any heroine ever menstruated in any book that you've ever read? And I thought, well, why are these words so charged? What's the matter with this? And there is one single word that if you stop to think, there's a four-letter word for everything, except one. Can anybody here tell me a four-letter word for menstruation? A commonly used four-letter word. Come on! All of you women menstruate, what do you do every month? Hurt. Yeah. This is the most amazing thing because menstruation is absolutely wiped out of our culture, totally wiped out. It is something that every woman experiences once a month for as long as she lives, most of the time. <laughs> and why is there such a taboo that this can never be mentioned? How could religion get involved in something of this and put a charge in such a way that it's impossible uh, to do anything at all with these ideas? The other thing, there are some other things that go into this. If you look at every tale in the Bible, the biological processes are reversed. The male gives birth. The male gives birth. There was Adam, and a rib was removed from him, and he gave birth to a woman through that removed rib. Or in folk tales, it is always the man who somehow or other, taking from himself, makes something. And then that was a woman. But there was something mystical and magic about women from the very, very beginning, and that was this. Women bled. Men bled and they died. They didn't have a chance. If men started to bleed, particularly from their penis, forget it, son. You're out. The ball game's over. But women magically bled month in and month out. And the men did know, not know why those women bled. 
And this was an extraordinary, fabulous thing for them. So the men had to try to start to find what a woman was doing. And although this is a healthy function, it was seen as taboo. And in the very beginnings of the human community, all menstruating women were forced to remove themselves from the village. Every single, every single culture menstruating women had to get out of the village and were put into tiny shelters outside the village where the garbage was dumped while they were in this menstrual phase. So I looked at it. Menstruation occurs in the human race, in anthropoid apes, in chimpanzees, in gibbons, in baboons, in old world monkeys. And I have started research on these and I know more about monkeys, chimpanzees, and bam, uh, baboons, I think, than anybody in the, in, in the world. <laughs> the rhesus monkey is what has been studied in the United States and there are very, very scanty observations on the rest of them. But all of the primates have a menstrual cycle of approximately 28 days. And the human cycle is 28 days with a vari variability of from two to three days. That is from 25 to 30 days. The onset at age 12 in the white race, 13 and a half. In the darker races, 11. And the modal duration of menstruation is five days. This is all so terribly important to religion, you're not going to believe it. However, the lunar month is 28 days. And one of the things that was happening was seasonal changes, changes in the stars, changes in the moon, and somehow or other, the stellar events also got entangled with religion, but in a peripheral way, until we had Zvant Arrhenius, who in 1898 wrote a scientific paper that women menstruated according to the phases of the moon, and that if the phase of the moon governed their menstruation, one could see what they were doing from looking at the moon phases. And two Englishmen by the name of Gunn and Jenkins took up this theory and distributed through the Western world. There also was a poem that was put out by Virgil in his Georix book number three. And in that he talked about an insect we called the gadfly. The gadfly was a little brute insect with a shrill buzz that drives cattle mad. So they took this word of gadfly over and put it in the Greek, and the madness in the cattle then was called the estrus. In Latin, the neuter is estrum, and the masculine form is estrus. And in 1907, a man by the name of Walter Hoop, a student, Heap, H-E-A-P-E, a student of physiology of reproduction in rhesus monkeys, rhesus monkeys and langurs, which is an Asiatic monkey, noted that there were recurrent periods of sexual excitement in these an animals. In 1901 was the first observation that they had an estrus period. And it was a period of frenzy in which the female reached out to the male. And when the female was not in a period of estrus, she would not reach out to the male. Well, then some studies were done by Davis and Terman, indicating that chimpanzees also, these are all primates and we're primates, had these estrus periods. And that during these estrus periods, there was a maximal genital swelling and the labia of the chimpanzees began to swell and that ovulation was imminent depending on when you saw the labia starting to turn a deeper purple with the engorgement of blood to that labia. Now women produce eggs. We produce one a month. Actually, it depends on how many ovaries you've got because the ovarian cycle and I'll get to the doctors who say this in a minute, is 60 days, not 30. So you get one egg from the right ovary and one leg egg from the left ovary and one egg from the right ovary and one egg from the left ovary. And during that period of producing of the egg, women's lobbyists swell and become engorged with blood. And women have a heat period and a change in temperature. It's called the women's basal body temperature. 
which is elevated on the day she ovulates with a genitalia swelling or engorgement of labia with the blood. So I began to read furiously at this point. I read about guinea pigs, 1917, the major study on guinea pigs. I read about rats, 1921, the major studies on rats. And I read about pigs, and a major study on pigs was 1919, and all of the study on the rhesus monkeys and everything else, all of this was over by 1930. They knew it all. Everything was done. And from there on in, there has been absolutely nothing done. Everything was known about human sexuality, about the estrus period, about the sexual demand by the female, which is intense and irrepressible. There are certain times you can't satisfy your women, you men. <laughs> and you hate to admit that. Also, as I started to go on with this, many of the breeding systems, many of the breeding seasons have to do with seasons. A tremendous number of species of animal life are only in heat in certain periods and only bring forth their young in certain periods. And it's all cyclical. Marine plants, marine animals, have reproductive cycles which are controlled by the tides. This is fascinating, and it's unending. The shortest cycle is a domestic fowl which lays an egg every day, and the longest cycle that I can find right now is a locust, which is every 17 years. And everything has an estrus period. Rats and mice are four to five days, guinea pigs 15 days, cows, mares, and swine 21 days, and it's always a female, always a female, always a female. The men don't have this. I had to uh, invent some terminology as I was going on this. But the estrus in every animal, in everything, excites the female. There is sexual excitement. There is a sexual appetite. There is restlessness. There is diminished appetite for food. Where do you think fasting come from? Where do you think ignoring from foods come from? And there is aggressive sexual behavior by the female during those days. Well, what about seasons? The phenomena of anovolatory cycle when animals do not ovulate. What about this? I got, I was stunned, absolutely stunned. I went back to this last study on rhesus monkeys in 1932 by by Hartman, and I found that in the very young animals in the f few, first few weeks after the establishment of menstruation and in fully mature females, this is early in the fall and the late spring. I haven't figured that out yet. Is that the beginning and the ending of the active breeding season, the winter months? And it also occurs in frequent, frequently in women something goes on when they're approaching menopause. So I went to Kinsey and Havelock Ellis and Masters and Johnson. Every goddamn one of them are wrong. They are wrong. They are wrong because they have not really looked at the female over history. They have done, not done their reporting accurately. Men have orgasms. Women do not. What women have is a rhythmic thing like this that grabs up the sperm and gets it up into the tubes. Women do not ejaculate. They don't, they don't have anything to ejaculate. There's nothing there. Well, what about pregnancy then? What about lactation? Let's look at the apes and the chimpanzees and the gibbons and the baboons. Do they copulate and ovulate during these periods? And in the primates, in every study that I have picked up, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies. I sat down at these libraries here for I don't know how many hours. When they are producing milk for the young, they do not ovulate. When they are lactating, they do not ovulate. When they do not ovulate, they do not permit the approach of the male. Twelve months for baboons. They will not permit the male to approach them for 12 months when they are lactating, unless the baby dies. 
and they dry up. Pigtail monkeys, 12 months. These poor old males are going insane. 18 months for macaw monkeys, 24 months for chimpanzees, 36 to 48 months for orangutans. And I'm reading everything that everybody is doing, going out in the jungles and watching these animals, and they're all afraid to say when and when they don't, when they do and when they don't fuck. Read any of them, read them all. They lay out there in those bushes all the time. You mean to tell me they're not observing this? The only primates that they have been able to study have been observed in captivity, which may affect the behavior due to the conditions attending the captivity. Like the human female, most primates do not menstruate during that lactation period, certainly not during the first part of it. You've all had children and you know that you didn't have menstrual periods immediately after those children were born when you were first lactating, unless the milk dried up. What about producing of this milk? 12 months for the bamboos and, and, and the pigtails. Well, I've given you that and it's exactly the same. When ovaries are removed promptly and permanently, sexual behavior disappears. I'll repeat that. When ovaries are removed promptly and permanently, sexual behavior disappears in this whole primate race. They never display again sexually sex receptive behavior. This goes to rats, rabbits, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, horses, and cows. They have no sexual attraction for or to the males. Now in all of this, as I'm looking by, as I say, I have to invent some words. The human male is susceptible to sexual arousal by eye, by ear, by smell, every conceivable way, by tactile touch. So I have said, as I'm reading this to myself, I've invented the term that the men are on a standby ready alert. <laughs> and I continue to read the, the group activity and I find out that in every primitive society they lived in a state of promiscuity first. And that is all of the females serviced all of the males. And I mean by this that the women who were in heat serviced all the males and the women who were lactating or menstruating or were in a quiescent period permitted those particular females to service those men. There isn't a woman in the world, for instance, one woman right here today, not me, I'm too old for this game, can take all of you men on tonight. What's the expression, fuck you till your brains fall out? <laughs> and she won't be tired. Not a one of you men can stand up to a woman in heat, not a one. Come on, what's your record? <laughs> I was a psychiatric so social worker for years and years and years and listened to the tales of women. And uh, I know what your stamina is. You men lie like I can't tell you five times a night. Who are you kidding? <laughs> but the whole point is that women can outdo men in human sexuality and the men cannot take this because it is against their ideas of machoism. Women are not supposed to be able to do this. On the other hand, Ann Landers is right. Women would rather be hugged and fondled most of the time than to have sex constantly. And I think that this is because we have rhythmic heat periods when we desire it. Why is always that good girl, wham, the first time she tries that she's pregnant? Because, and simply because, she is at her lowest resistance during the heat period when she does have an egg to be fertilized. There's no way she's, she's going to go ahead and her Intellect cannot tell her nay because her body tells her to go on. And it's always that good girl, oh, I never thought that Susie would do it. And Susie got caught. Well, after there was a state of promiscuity in most of these primitive organizations of people, there was group marriage. And after that, there was polygamy. 
and then polyandry, and then a combination of the two, and then sex communism, and then clans of intermarrying groups. And all of this came about before monogamous marriage. So then I got down to statistics. How many women died in childbirth? Who knows? Come on, who knows? How many, how many children does an ordinary woman have? And why? I went hunting graveyards in America to find out how many children women had. I went to vital statistic bureaus all over the United States in Washington, D.C., and a central one in Austin, Texas, saying how many children do women have? How many times do they become pregnant? How many pregnancies can they have? How many do they take uh, to its full completion? How many do they miscarry? How many do they lose? Uh, in uh, the times of Jesus, how many children did a woman have? How were the children spaced? Why were they spaced? What was the childbirth rate in 6,000 BC, 2,000 BC, 1,000? Nobody has got a figure. There isn't a culture who has ever done any statistical gathering on women like this. And if sexual activity starts at the age of sexual maturation, what are we going to do about the fact that women desire sexual relations when they're 12 or 13? Well, you know, I, as an atheist, I got in trouble with all of you 20 years ago because I kept saying when they're big enough, they're old enough. Just teach them two things. One, how to avoid venereal disease. Two, how to avoid pregnancy and send them on their way. Because... <laughs> during my cultural era, we were taught that we had to be celibate until the time that we were married and at the time that we were married, overnight, like that, you turned into a sex pot. I got news for you. If you've been repressing your sexual desires from the time you're 12 until the time you're 21, when you're 21, you ain't going to turn them on. I'll give you a little brief insight into uh, my marital life here. I shouldn't do this. But uh, I was so conditioned by my parents about the need for women not to enjoy sex, the need for women not to involve themselves in sex, that I had a hell of a time with my husbands. He would say, honey, let's make love. And I'd say, all right, you go right ahead while I finish this chapter in this book I'm reading. And uh, you know, he didn't like it very much. But this is how I was taught. And I think that most of the women of my age were taught in this way. There's another thing. You men are bare. This is it. We can fake it. There isn't a woman in here who hasn't lied to her husband. He says, honey, did you come? <laughs> and she looks at him and she says, yes, honey, you did. <laughs> but women are such liars in bed that it's incredible. Night after night after night, they lie to you and you better know it. I don't care what kind of a relationship you have. Women are liars. And we have learned the deceit in bed which we carry into the community. But you men can't do that. One, you have to have an erection. And if you can't have it, your woman knows. <laughs> she can hide from you what she's doing, but you can't hide from her. Number two, if you can't have an ejaculation, she knows it. She does the cleanup job. <laughs> you can't hide anything from her. All women know what men's capacity are, and no men know what women's capacity are. Because we are in a culture of lying and cheating, particularly in the sexual relationship. In your orgasm, you have to secrete semen, and your penis must lose its erection. And if you say to your wife, honey, is that enough? <laughs> As you wilt, what's she going to do? <laughs> In all animals, as I say, the men have to strut, the men have to show off, the men have to get it up, the men have to show that they are able, that they are capable of impregnation. So what in God's name does all of this have to do with religion? With women also, with your heat periods, the other thing that women did that men could not do, absolutely, 
We outdid you, and you hated us for it. We produced another human life. There it is. You couldn't do it. There was no way that a man could do it. Do you know what they did in, re in um, um, the human community for a long time? This fascinated me. The men, I've got the name for it in here, and when I get to it, I'll tell you about it in a little bit. The men used to slit the undersurface of the penis right in front of the scrotum, and they would bleed a little bit from that. And in many of the primitive communities, this little slit was made because men then could say, well, I'm in straight too. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I got extremely excited about is in the Island of Man, there was a museum. And this museum had little clay things that men put on that looked like jock straps. And I went and specifically to visit an exhibit of one of these things because it showed the lobby and the clitoris. And men used to put this over top of their penis and scrotum attached with two little strands in primitive communities so that they could make believe they were women. It's fascinating. But women had a couple of things. One, they stopped bleeding. They stopped bleeding as soon as they became pregnant. And this worried the men. And accompanying this bleeding, after they had stopped bleeding for several months, for no reason at all, magic, big God in heaven. <laughs> after they had stopped bleeding, their stomach began to swell and they had disorders associated with food. And after their stomach swelled for some time, there was an absolute belief clear into the 16th and 17th century in many of the primitive communities that women were accumulating their blood. The menstrual blood was accumulating within them and after they got enough menstrual blood accumulated inside themselves that the menstrual blood entered some sort of tissue and from this come a child. As a matter of fact, the physician, the great physician, Ayurveda, in the 6th and 7th century, is the one who decided that this was the theoretics and uh, said that the woman retained this blood plus the father's semen and something called manus, which was the mind, an atman, which is a subtle substance similar to a soul, and all of these together formed the fetus. And this was believed really for thousands of years. But then we get down to labor itself. And as we get down to labor, my God, here is the altar. Here is the human sacrifice. Because every single animal, female animal prepares a nest. They clean it, they bed it. They make it certain that they have a decent place to bring forth their child. And the woman in the human community was doing the same thing. It looks like she decided that the ultimate thing should be a plain, clean stone on which she could drop, drop her child. This very plain, clean stone. And it had to be cleaned and it had to be everything because what the women were doing then, I'm convinced, I've never word or read a word about it, but I am totally convinced because every single animal does it. The women ate the afterbirth. The women ate the afterbirth. And if you look at an afterbirth piece, it looks like a, almost a little, in certain shapes, a little round piece of uh, unleavened bread. And there's always a half a cup to a cup full of blood. And that Holy Communion is symbolic women eating the afterbirth as every priest shoves that little communion tablet in, they are eating the afterbirth that women used to do. Oh, why should women eat the afterbirth? Why should they prepare a clean place and why should they eat the afterbirth? So I started to do research in afterbirth. What do they do with it? 17 years I was a psychiatric social worker. And one of the things that I found out in all that time is that women have postpartum depression. A lot of women have postpartum depression. A lot of women have an inability to lactate, to bring down the milk. My God, she's not bringing down the milk. Go and get her doctor. How about a specialist? She's not bringing down her milk. And then the other thing, and this happened to me, 
The uterus doesn't contract. Oh, now, Mrs. O'Hare, your uterus hasn't contracted yet. We've got to bring a therapist in here to beat your uterine with uterus with their fists in order to pummel you down so your uterus don't go down. So I thought I started to ask, aren't there enzymes in this afterbirth? Can't we just take the woman's afterbirth and if she doesn't want to eat a goddamn thing, at least distill it down and take it and shoot her up with it? Because maybe this will make her lactate. Maybe this will make her stop her postpartum depression. Maybe this will help her uterus to contract. Nature has meaning. Why do they, all of the other animals eat it and we don't? And why did men seize upon it to pass it out to everybody in communion tablets, the blood in the tablet? Why? Because it's important. Something is missing in the birth process. And then why should women be supine so that they cannot use gravity to help them give birth? And on all of the primitive communities, the women squatted. They squat to give birth. And there we lie helpless while the men are trying to dig the uterus, the child out of our uterus. And we are absolutely helpless. Why not squat? Oh, I got into everything. You know, I think that the natural position for human fornication is doggy style. I'm totally convinced of it now. I think that a woman on her hands and knees can withdraw from a man if she does not want him. She can control the act. However, when the man is on top, you know, you weigh up a hell of a lot, you guys. I t we're pinned down there. And your woman might tell you, but we're pinned down there, and often you're heavy as hell, and you sweat and you stink. <laughs> and it's uncomfortable for us. And we say, yes, dear, we're smiling. But it's time for us to look at some of these habits and say, what's going on here? What's going on here? Are we or are we not a part of the primates? And it's important for us to understand we're a part of the primates. You know, we have the best debater for the theory of evolution that I know in the United States, Frank Zinner, and doesn't know a goddamn thing about it. I'll tell you why. Dar Darwin didn't know a goddamn thing about it either. Because the entire debate about evolution is this. There's only one thing that underpins the whole thing. Darwin said we're part of the animal kingdom. And the religious community is saying we are not animals. We are a special creation of God made in his image and we don't have physical bodies. Only the bad women have physical bodies. The bad women who incite the men. I'm starting to look at this. When women are in an estrus period, they emit an odor. And oh, it is nice. <laughs> and all of you men who recognize that they omit an odor during that period, you like it. And this is a signal to you when you can come on strong. So what did the church do? They invented incense in the church to cover it up. They invented perfume to disguise it. And what else did they do? I was coming home from, on an airplane in Chicago, from Chicago. And I'm sitting there and the rain is beating down in the airplane. And suddenly I thought, oh my God, what is baptism? What is baptism? They're anointing the child's head with water. You know what those men were doing? They were giving birth because the child comes out dripping wet. Dripping wet from swimming in the solution in the uterus. They're, they have seized the birth process. This is what religion is about, a great deal of religion. The priest, the celibate priest, is in his nine months of sexual inactivity, as is the woman who is not in an estrus period. He can go them one better. He's celibate for life. And he wears gowns that are maternity clothes. <laughs> cause for prostitution. This was a cause for sacred prostitution. Every woman, remember, in every culture, clear up through the Greeks and the Romans, had to go and spend one day in the temple and give themselves to any man who came because she was simulating her long repressed heat periods. 
and it was a law of tradition that she go in and take on all comers that day. But prostitution, ritual prostitution, these are only cultural lag demonstrations of what really was. And then I start to think, well, why do we got these things around our neck? You know, and they count, they count, they count, they count. Count them. They're from one menstrual period to another. And the Muslims somehow or other know that we do ovaries alternately. So theirs are twice as long as ours. Their prayer beads are exactly double the Roman Catholic prayer beads. Well, those dumb son of a bitches are counting from one menstrual period to another, they don't even know it. And they're saying, Hail Mary. <laughs> you get on your knees in church because this is a birth position. It is a part of the crouch position. You go and you put your tongue out to get this wafer. And what about the hours of pain? Ordinarily, it takes 14 hours for a woman to give birth to a child, from the beginning of the labor pains to the end. And this is part of the invention of torture, because we have to use that kind of thing to bring forth the ultimate truth. And the ultimate truth is a production of the baby. So the torture simulated in many instances the rhythmic birth pains, the rhythmic contractions. Have you seen these South American pictures where they take and put for sacrifice, they take and arch the body of the victim over a rock and then slit them and it's males, but they must listen to the heart first and try to locate the heart because everybody can hear the heart of a baby bumping in there. So the male sacrifice down in South America was to slit open their belly and see if the males had a child inside. And they found the child in the beating heart because the heart was still beating when they made that incision and took it out. So we have in a continual way all of these kind of references to pregnancy and to births that in, a con in, in every thing available coming with the males and the females. You know what I think happened? I'm still struggling with this. I'm still doing research. I can't tell you how much research I'm doing. Just a minute till I try to see if I can't find here a particular, oh, reference to give you a date when it was first discovered that women ovulate. Two Japanese did it. They did it uh, by observing a series of operations. Well, I'll have to come to it when I come to it. But I think that what happened is that there were some men who decided that they had to have power. And in order to have power, they had to control the males. And one way to control the males is to control their sex drive. And the first circumcision was always at age 12, 11, 12, and 13, when men were first able to ejaculate as you turn from young boys into young adults. Just the moment that it is seen that you can have an ejaculation in these primitive cultures, the men were circumcised. And I think that this was an act of terrorism against the young studs coming up in order to keep a very small group of older men in power. So they circumcised you. And we still have the residual of that in the United States. I just got an article in the, into, in the mail yesterday in which a group of persons have taken surveys on circumcision in the United States and 35% of the women who were having sexual relations with males could not tell if they were circumcised or not. Don't you laugh? I'll tell you why. 50% of the males did not know if they were circumcised or not. 
50% of the males, because they grab them up in the hospital these days, and the young men out there don't know whether they're circumcised or not. They think that they've had that like that all the time, and that is natural for them. But you see what this does is expose the beatus, which is a very sensitive part of the penis, and with that, through that lack of sensitivity, this is a way to control your sexual desire. And I'm pretty certain that the next thing that happened is that those old male bulls decided that they would apportion the women, one woman to one man. And the women had to be indoctrinated into accepting men at any time, at any place for the male assigned to them. And instead of conforming to the old natural primitive state of the primates, they were mated one on one. And I think that this quote marriage invention was a power game play by the religious community which attached to it all kinds of special, special rituals and significance which finally turn into religion and the primary function of all of religion has been to regulate the sexual lives of both the males on a one-to-one -one pair bonding and on females to satisfy that male desire when and as the male desired to be satisfied. And I am convinced that we are in a cultural milieu where that exists now. And that means, are you against marriage, Mrs. O'Hare? I have such strong family ties, I can't tell you. I absolutely idolized my family, I always have. And a strong sense of generic family pride for grandfathers, great grandfather, great, great 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 just down the line. I have, and I don't know where I got this from, probably enculturated, but I think the family is wrong. I think the family is wrong. So then I got a little item in the newspaper that reported that the number of mentally deficient children born in America today is higher in the Roman Catholic than in any other group. Boy, did that set me off. I have done everything that I can to find out about that. And I want some money for an experiment. Chicken lays, chickens lay eggs. So what I want to do is get a sample group of chickens over here with some roosters. <coughs> and weigh and measure and test the physical and the adaptive qualities of the little chickens that are born from this group where those eggs are impregnated immediately. And then I want to take that same group perhaps or an identical group and I want to take those eggs and artificially let them hold for one hour for two hours, for three hours in sample groups before the sperm impregnates them. And then I want to impregnate them with fresh sperm, day-old sperm, two-day-old sperm, three-day-old sperm, and see the effect that this has on them. Because I think that perhaps we have had some genetic difficulties over thousands of years for the following reasons. The men are standby ready alert and they let their sperms go when they can and the women quite frequently are not in the heat season or the ovum is already coming down the birth canal and it has started to decay for a day, for an hour, for two hours, for 24 hours, for a day, for two days before it's impregnated by the sperm. Or the sperm can be going up the fallopian tubes and be a day old, two days old, three days old and starting to lose its viability before it impregnates the egg. And I think it might have been better along the line if the women were always in the absolute tip-top utmost heat condition and the men were there fresh for the laying before a child was produced. 
And nobody has ever even tried to do this along the way. Nobody has tried to do any kind of statistical gathering with when did you fornicate, when did you fornicate, you know, etc. When was your heat period, when wasn't your heat period, etc. But I'm wondering if we have some of the genetic difficulty that we have because of this. I'm not crazy. I know some of you may think I am. But the thing is, none of this has been looked at anywhere along the way. Nobody has looked at it. In every single bit, for instance, of the mutilation and the torture, it has always been sexual. Always been sexual. And in the Muslim culture with this infibulation, that is the sewing up of the vulva during the childhood, this is a sexual assault against the woman. The clitoris being chopped off. The urethral opening being closed. Oh, and incidentally, when the men used to cut underneath their penis, this was called subincision. A slitting of the ventral surface of the piece of penis and the urethra in order to have an effusion of blood from time to time in those primitive societies. I'll get to you in a minute because I want to try to wind this up. If any place that you go, it's the male that's on the aggressive. In our culture, it's the female who has to pretend she's aggressive. It's the female who has to put on the colors. It's the female who has to get her tits into a harness in order to try to get the male. And incidentally, there is a dislocation then of the sensory uh, apparatus because that isn't what excites women. That stimulation of the breast. What excites the women are this, is the stimulation of the clitoris. So you have a displacement too of the sexual signals that are going on. And as I said, food preferences, the fasting, the elimination of certain foods. Anytime you've ever seen a woman in morning sickness, you know exactly what I'm meaning by this. I am slowly getting this all together and trying to do what I can do. Casting out devils was the assistance at the childbirth. Exercising the spirits, releasing from possession is bringing forth this child. Also, women helped women for the birth process until our times. And now the male doctor has taken over. And this is why the witches had to be killed, because they were bringing along with them old herbal remedies, old remedies of assisting at births. And it was always a woman helping a woman until our times. The repetition of the word formula. Go into a hospital and listen to a woman cry out in pain. Undistinguishable sounds quite frequently. Yelling in a repeated rhythm as the labor pains hit her. So if the woman's role in religion, the men simply assume it symbolically and then tie the women into this and go on to greater glory, we see what it looks like. You all heard Ben Ackerley the other day. From the very beginning to the very end of religion, women have been told that they are no good. They are the uh, ministers of Satan. They are the persons that are tied to the flesh. All of you men are spiritual. You do the thinking. And women are tied to the rhythm of menstruation and human sexuality. And as I say here, I'm looking at some of this and I'm a little bit disjointed with it now. But <clears throat> sprinkling, oh, it's the amniotic fluid, which is in the, the uterus at the time of the birth that brings out the child uh, in a, you know, with some fluid with it. And once again, as I said, the cardinal rule was that no one can officiate at a religious ceremony unless they have been given some sort of authority for that. And the authority for that, for one woman to help another one, is I have had a child. And since I have had a child, I can help you officiate at your childbirth. And all of this was taken over from the women. I'm trying to bring a book out on relation, in relationship to this. And I was absolutely fascinated by a dial of the atheist message of Frank Zindler that I read in one of his little books this last week because I wrote this seven years ago. And so the grand creation was a pregnant male god
who gave birth to the earth and to the entire solar system and to the universe in one super birth. And he did that which was later shown to be impossible because now something has to come out of something, but he created it out of nothing. Just like women seem to have done before we knew where children came from. And this great God had a super ejaculation and that super ejaculation was the universe and we're worshiping it today. I mean, it is just so incredible that I can't believe that it's going on. The Hireems right now in the Muslim culture are simply residuals of the original fact that one woman in heat one day, so the Shah moves from one heat possessed woman to another heat possessed woman and he has to have 365 just in case she's only doing it once a year. <laughs> All of this, I think, has been a way to gain power and to gain control and you men are in as considerable a trap as we women are. Every single one of you are in the same trap because you are called into this pairing along with the women with the women and the women are tied to you to service the male and that's our only job you say fuck and we jump in and we fuck and that's the command for the woman in a marriage today it isn't what she wants it isn't what she thinks it isn't what she feels it's what you want and i think that it's important to know that men have been very very slow in finding discovering what's going on if you've read Freud with his totem and taboo, he said that human sexuality or religion came from the totem and the taboo, etc. I'm not quite sure at all. I think that that was as men moved from fish scooper out of the water and from food gatherer and from everything else, they finally got to domestication of animals and then they said, lo, look what they're doing. And when they did, then they made a totem of any animal that they saw which was reproductive and they used that as uh, something significant. Also, I think we ought to have to talk about incest too in a, in a little bit in this because there was this mysterious, awesome crevice between a woman's legs. And if you entered it with your penis, you had to recognize that from there you might have been given birth. So you never had seen that crevice. You did not enter it again symbolically. And there were many matrilineal societies that you could not have sex with your sister. She came out of that hole. You could not have sex with a cousin because the cousin had come out of the hole of a super old woman. So this whole crevice emergence thing is also associated with this. And the horror of incest in the human community uh, has been involved in this. One of the things that has absolutely floored me, has it, have you ever gone to the cliff dwellings in Mexico? How could a pregnant woman get up and down those ladders? I think of every single one of those cliff dwellings were places where pregnant women were put until they got done with the birth process because there's no way any of you could have gone up, the, up and down those ladders with your stomach out like that. So a, as you go every place, you see evidences of this. And I have taken every single thing uh, for every religious concept and every single one of them can be associated with this concept of birth, this concept of everything else. Now we've re recently had a sexual revo revolution in the America. And that sexual revolution, that sexual freedom, as I look back on it now and I see it in the 1960s, that sex sexual freedom was the right that women were demanding to service men sexually as their choice. And they were still in the same trap because that was their original duty according to this hierarchy or power symbol uh, that we had. Well, let me, get, let me stop there because, my God, it's 2 o'clock already. But I think that these rituals, these value systems have been frozen into our culture and they continue 
to have a performance of acts, both symbolic and in other ways, that still keep going, despite the fact that we don't know anything at all about them. There is absolutely no research being done on it. No one knows what is going on. And this book will never come out because I'm never going to have money enough for a secretary or a fellow researcher or anything else. So I'm happy to have given you this today and I'll entertain questions for a short while and let's see where we go from here. I'm hoping that what I'm doing here is going to satisfy our aims and purposes to stimulate and promote freedom of thought and inquiry concerning religious beliefs, creeds, dogmas, tenets, rituals, and practices. You had a question, Chris? All of it. And I believe that the tie in there with the uh, older agency Yes. 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 Uh, it's the Catholic rhythm method that I think may be producing these. Incidentally, I had no idea about this. I got onto a uh, uh, debate once uh, with a Roman Catholic psychiatrist. And she was telling me that the incident of uh, women's oral satisfying of their husbands by uh, cunilinguus is much greater in the Roman Catholic than in any of the Protestant groups because the men have to have satisfaction and the women feel that they cannot have an entry into the vagina and that this will injure the rhythm system so that they are much more involved in cunilingual activity than the Protestant group. That floored me. Absolutely floored me, as I had no idea. Yes, sir. Yeah. I don't think we're going to make it. I don't think I'm ever going to get out Jesus Christ super fraud either, although it's so easy to prove that that was a myth that it's incredible. And I have political books and I have other books. I have, I'm constantly involved with theoretics. I have uh, seven books right now that I'm working on simultaneously, and I don't think it's going to go. I really don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I'm trying to find the name of these two Japanese heroes while I'm at it, too. But go ahead while I'm looking for this. Yes, sir, in back. Sing out, because I have to hear you. I can't hear you at all. Uh, the, he, this young man is probably a born-again Christian and we'll need to inject him in a few minutes. But meanwhile, he got thrown out of the Buddy Hicks... Uh, uh, if you'll lay it down on the table, we'll get to it later. Do we have some questions from atheists? Yeah. They exhibit absolutely what a Christian is, which is intolerance. Alan, you had a question?
There are some police outside. Gerald, would you just get them? Ellen, you had a question. The question is, have I ever noticed, and have all of the women in here ever noticed, that a doctor says that he delivered a baby, instead of saying that a woman delivered the baby? Incidentally, one of the other questions that I notice as I'm going through here trying to find these two Japanese uh, men that I want to tell you about is that uh, there is no four-letter word for giving child, giving birth to a child. As a matter of fact, if any of you can come to a uniform word for delivery of a child, please tell me what it is. Because this is so taboo that it, it, it isn't a yeah, pain. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that this that milk appeared suddenly and spontaneously with women. Suddenly, uh, you give birth to the baby and the next day or that evening or within hours, the milk is there. And this, there is no, absolutely no word for this when the milk appears. So that menstruation, childbirth, and lactation, there is no way that we can have a phrase for this. Um, when I was growing up, we used to say that my Aunt Mabel was visiting when we were menstruating. And incidentally, also as I was growing up, one of the most remarkable things that ever occurred, occurred. Because when I first menstruated, my mother provided me with uh, sheets of flannel, about 18 inches square. And we had to be very, very careful what to do with those sheets of flannel. Uh, we first soaked them in cold water uh, to get the blood out because blood, you know, women who faint at the sight of blood, have always uh, in, been a mystery to me since we face it once a month all of our lives, you know. <laughs> but we had 18 inch pieces of flannel and we would use those and menstruate in those and then uh, soak them in cold water and then later on we would be able to um, uh, uh, wash them out. But what we had to do with our laundry when we hung it out in the yard in uh, upper middle class neighborhoods, and I w I'm born and bred an upper middle class white Protestant, you put the towels on the outside, and then you put the sheets next to that because sometimes indescribable things were in the sheets. Uh, and then you put the men's shirts and the men's pants, and the under underpants had to be inside, and the menstrual rags, and that's what they were called because they were unhemmed, were put on the inside because the neighbors didn't dare see your underwear on the line, they didn't dare say you see your menstrual, quote, rags on the line. And uh, if we got absolutely reduced to the most filthy, filthy, rotten language, we would say, I'm riding the rag. And that's all. And in 1930s, in the early 1930s, two miraculous things came again from China and Japan. One was Kleenex. And the ad was, don't put a cold in your pocket. Blow your nose in a piece of paper and throw it away. This is what the Japanese do and they're cleaner uh, with this. Because we used to have handkerchiefs and Jesus, they were rotten to deal with in the wash. And the second thing is came paper sanitary napkins. In the 1930s in America, don't think they're that old. They weren't there before. And we were absolutely floored and the women would get together and say, are you going to use those things? They're paper. What are you going to do with them after you get done with them? The dogs will get them. They'll smell them. What are we going to do? <laughs> and incidentally, this is why rats ran up women's clothes. This is why dogs sniffed women, because they could smell blood. Oh, my God, he's smelling my blood. When I was growing up, I could not touch any food while I was menstruating. My mother wouldn't let me prepare any meals. She wouldn't let me do any canning. I couldn't bake anything because all food that all menstruating women touched either soured or went bad. And I'm only 65. I'm only 60. I never saw the word menstruating until I was about 40. I had no idea what it meant at all. There are, the word social disease was used in the newspapers until the 1950s. Nobody even knew what venereal disease was. And when I first saw the words venereal disease, I couldn't find out what they meant. 
had no idea what they could possibly mean. This is how bad it was in the United States for all of these years, too. Some other questions? ...purposes, and that uh, there's no reason to breed from two persons, particularly if what's coming from that breeding uh, looks like it's not going to be bad. I don't think that we would do this with... No farmer would do it with any livestock, what we do with the human race. No farmer would do it. They would eliminate genetically anything that was bad. Incidentally, what is it, uh, tie sacks that the Jews have, and uh, sickle cell amenia, uh, aneba, amenia, <laughs> that the blacks have? I actually think that we should seek them out and say to those people, hey, say to those people, hey, we got something to talk to you about. Look at here what's going to happen with a child if you have it. Now, why don't you go ahead for sterilization? Because why drag it on? in the human community and cause that much suffering and that much grief. Adopt a baby, do something, but let's stop some of this stuff. I think that would be more humane, and I think that we should do this. Incidentally, people get frightened. They say, there is genetic uh, misconduct by the scientists right now, and we're going to get, the Roman Catholic Church particularly is fighting it, don't any of you remember that none, nobody could get married for years and years and years and years without going and getting a Wasserman test? The state would not issue a license. Everybody had one. You had to be checked for venereal disease. You had to be free that night. You could get it that night. <laughs> but when you went and you got your, your marriage license, you had to have a Wasserman. Now, let me tell you something a little bit about also what I feel should be an atheist uh, position in respect to marriage. <clears throat> and I say this every place, and since I'm speaking for you, you should know what I'm saying. I say that marriage, uh, heterosexual or homosexual, I don't care which, but an association between two people which involves a physical association, an intellectual association, an economic association, an emotional association, a psychological association is so private that it is only their business. I don't think you should go to the state and get a license for it. I don't think, I don't think that you should go to your parents and ask them if you can do it. And I don't think that you should seek out their church. Now let me tell you what I've been saying in colleges across the country and chastise me if you will. I'll still continue to say it. I will generally pick out two young people in the audience, like this woman in a red jacket and this man over here that says uh, military atheist. Mil yeah. And I will say, now you know you too can go and rent an apartment or you can buy a home and you can move in that and you can live together. You can have economic intercourse one with another, both of you giving to that home. You can eat together, cook together. You can wash your clothes together. You can think together. You can argue together. You can do anything that you want to in that home. Anything. You can even sleep together. Everything is cool. What's the one thing that you're not permitted to do without a license? Fuck. <laughs> now why should you go to the state and you as a woman say, I promise you that I will only permit this one man to insert his penis in my uh, uterus, my vulva, as long as I shall live. Why should you do that? Or why should that man say, I promise only to use this dilly whacker on this one woman, <laughs> and I will never use it on any other woman? What the hell is this? This is a religious limitation upon your freedom and every one of you submit to it, and I have submitted to it. So I am going around the country and I'm saying to people, have a union, have a good one. Not a one night stand, I'm not talking about a free lay. I'm talking about loving one another freely, independently, equally. Live together for 20 years, Clarence and Ruby Darrow did. They lived together for 35 years and then they thought, don't you think we ought to get married before we die? And they did. 
Sartre, over in France, and uh, what's her name, Simone? Yeah, they decided that they wouldn't get married. They never did. And they have been living together for years and years and years. And I think that's better and healthier, and you feel co-equal, and you're bound by love and not by duty. You are bound by affection and intelligence and not by law, and that's a little bit better. And I think that you provide a better home for your children and more outreach and more love, more affection, more everything. And then you can have a total commitment. So I'm saying this in a continuing way. And as I said, I don't know what's going to come out of this. Uh, this is going to be a seven or 800 page book because I have gone into all of these animal studies and all of these cultural studies and I am challenging anthropology and I'm challenging sex studies and I am challenging uh, cultural studies and I am challenging the uh, concept of marriage. They'll love it when they find out in the Christian community. They'll say, I always knew she was against the family. But I don't care because I think this is right and I think that this should open up the doors to a tremendous amount of, um, of exploration to which the doors have been closed since 1930. And I would like to see it. More questions. Uh, five more minutes and then uh, we're gonna close off because at 3.30 I gotta come up here and go through a business meeting. Harry. No, there aren't, Harry. It's, I think it's superficial. I've read it. But go ahead. May the best sperm win. Uh, but I, I am not sure. Incidentally, the single biggest primate study group is at the University of Texas here. And uh, they have um, um, an entire section that they're doing study with. And I'm trying to keep up with them. And it's rather difficult uh, because they're not interested in the same areas as I am interested in, which are the rituals that the, they may get into, which I can try to uh, interpret in respect to religion. I saw another hand here somewhere. Okay, yeah. Uh, Dr. Harold, I want to congratulate you um, for your call for scientific uh, feminism, which is uh, the uh, true, true uh, human life uh, renaissance. And uh, I have a suggestion uh, after my thanks. Uh, I uh, would, would hope that perhaps uh, we could reach out to the grants people, the people who are experienced in doing foundation money and public uh, uh, study money. I Larry, they would shoot you on sight if you told them that this is what you wanted to explore. Well, all I know is there's a great big book of all the foundations in America and all the government grant uh, programs, and uh, we ought to be able to write it up somehow to get some money for these studies. Incidentally, I have been to every foundation in the United States seeking money. I have personally written to every, I'll repeat that because it's fantastic. I have person, I've written personal, independent letters to every foundation in America asking for money. Incidentally, the Kellogg Brothers, and this is one of the biggest corporations, I mean, uh, foundations in the United States, both Kellogg Brothers were atheists. And I have written asking for money and reminded them that the Kellogg's were atheists. And um, as a matter of fact, one of the persons on the board of directors is an atheist, and there is no way that we could get any money from Kellogg and or some other atheist foundations, yes. I'm not a liar. One of the things that's wrong with me is that I'm honest. should happen, I think that the atheists should finance our studies. 
and that they should be proud to do it. That's what I think the solution is. Well, do we have some other questions? I wanted to give you the names of these two Japanese men, and I cannot see them in here for anything in the world, and that's a shame because uh, they, they are so important uh, in these um, um, studies. And possibly without their actual exploration in Japan, you know, as an atheist country, uh, we wouldn't be where we are or I wouldn't be this far in what I'm doing. And I'm hoping to uh, find those in just a moment. Go ahead, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Her comment was that in regard to Thai sex and uh, regard to uh, uh, the sickle cell anemia, that uh, with recomb recombined genetic studies, they are hoping to eliminate this. And I think that any solution would be better than to continue to reproduce. Uh, and I think that we should be encouraging our scientific community in every way that we possibly can. Well, listen, it's a half, it's 2.30. Supposing we take a one-hour break and come on back here for the business meeting, membership cards or proof of membership or something because we always talk about finances and we don't give our financial information out to anyone. David, Chris Allen, you had something to say before we all leave? Oh, yes. Don't go away. Just a moment. Uh, people, one of the, our members is... Uh, one of our uh, members in Salt Lake City is an elderly woman. Uh, she's Dutch, Arendja Visser, a very strong supporter, one of the very first of the LIFE members, because they started the LIFE membership uh, uh, program in the Salt Lake City at the 1981 convention. And she couldn't be here. She's uh, too sick because of her heart condition. But she's uh, devoted to Madeline and uh, a strong believer in the atheists. Uh, it was her idea for us to get involved in the bus posters. Uh, Arendja Visser has made a donation to American Atheists. She has uh, done some craft work in uh, putting together a pillow and a very fine afghan. Uh, she is a real pro at this. She continues to win blue ribbons at the state fairs and other fairs in Utah. And she has donated this, and what I want to do is to auction it off, and the money goes to the national, goes to the chap, uh, goes to American atheists. So uh, I would like uh, to entertain uh, an opening bid. Uh, we will start at one hundred dollars. The yarn alone is forty-five dollars. Let me, let me have your attention. I'm, I, I hate to interrupt Chris right now because this is, this is very important, but we do have a general question and answer session scheduled uh, in just a few minutes. For any of you that would like to question uh, the officers or what have you for the American Atheists, general, uh, general interest questions. So any of those that are, that are interested in that, please, please remain in the room. Anybody who's interested, please come up, take a look at this. Uh, the pillow and the uh, afghan. This is uh, a very nice color, very tastefully done. Is uh, Do I see anybody who's interested? Well, I see some people standing up. Does that mean you're uh, interested? It's $100 for the chapter. Anybody want to make a, a donation to the chapter and get something for your money at the same time? I don't see anybody willing to give us a, a donation. All right. <laughs> okay. Certainly. Well, we'll leave it up here, and uh, uh, please come up and take a look at it when you get a chance. Uh, this is excellent work. Uh, it has won a blue ribbon itself at the Utah State Fair. Uh, come up and take a look at it. This is very, you know, you'd look at the handiwork involved.